Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all today? I hope great. I mean, weather-wise, yeah. not. <laughs> Uh, so welcome to Onside Gallery. Thank you for those of us who are joining us here today in person, and thank you to all those who are also joining us online today. My name is Susan Jama. I am the Programs and the Community Coordinator here at Onside Gallery. It's a pleasure to meet all of you in person and online. As the event host, I we would like to start with a land acknowledgement. Onside Gallery and OCAD University acknowledges the ancestral territories of the Mississauga of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and the Huron Wendat, who are the original owners and custodians of the land on which we work, stand, and create. Onsite Gallery is OCAD University's professional gallery and experimental curatorial platform for art, design, and digital media. Serving the OCAD U community and the public, Onsite Gallery aims to foster social and cultural transformations. We would like to thank our exhibition sponsors, Canada Council for the Arts, Ontario Arts Council, Toronto Arts Council, Scotiabank Contact, Photo Photography Film, sorry, Festival, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, York University, Department of Computational Arts at York University, Sessorium Center for Digital Arts and Technology, Nexus, Sympoetic Living Ontologies Lab. We also would like to acknowledge the support of Canada Council for the Digital Now grant. We would also like to thank OCAD U Live for producing our digital content, as well as thank our OCAD AV crew who are here with us today supporting the event. So just a few housekeeping tips. Um, we do have washrooms. They are the all gender washrooms, which are through the back and the corner out to your left hand side. Please feel free to help yourself to the fresh, hot mint tea. Those of us who are here today and for those of you who are at home, drink some tea as well with us. Um, we, ask that we, we ask that you not engage with the artworks during our discussion as some of the works do produce loud sound and when they're activated. After the discussion, today's event, uh, us, the gallery staff, as well as our awesome on-site gallery student monitors can assist you with the interactive works. And if you have any questions, please feel free to answer. We, we, will, we will definitely answer all of your questions. So I'm gonna hand over to Lisa Deanne Smith um, to start the program. Thanks, Susan. No worries. Thanks, Susan. Uh, my name is Lisa Deanne Smith. I'm the senior curator at Onsite Gallery um, and semi organized. For just a little outline on what the event is today so, each artist um, is going to talk for 10 minutes. We also have the, an artist duo online. Um, so, we'll have three 10 minute presentations. And then um, afterwards, we'll have a, uh, a little bit of conversation between the artists, and, um, and I've got a few questions prepared. And then we'll just open it up to the floor for any questions that you might have. Um, so to get started, we're going to start with Jane Tingley. So Jane um, is really the catalyst behind this amazing exhibition. She uh, is the curator as well as one of the artists uh, who has a piece in the exhibition. So her work is here. Uh, Jane, and for all of the artists, I've really just condensed their bios to a line or two. So please pick up um, these brochures. They're all around the gallery. They're free and there's the long version and all the detailed uh, biographies in the um, brochure as well as a curatorial essay that's really informative. So Jane is an artist, a curator, uh, the director of the Slow Labs, which uh, um, is an acronym for, I probably won't be able to pronounce it. Thank you. <laughs> and associate professor at York University. Her, um, so Jane, I'll let you uh, take it away. Do you need help turning on your mic? Why don't you take this one and I'll turn that one on. For it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there a clicker for this? Okay. Okay. And we got 10 minutes? Okay, yeah. good. I can time it. I'll let you know a minute. 
Okay, I might go a minute over. I've t I tried this a few times. <laughs> like, I got it as condensed as I can. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So I'm Jane, nice to see everyone here. Yep, next slide. Yep. That's not it. Oh. Yeah. So this is the piece that I'm going to be talking about, which is just over here. Actually, I'm just going to put my stopwatch on. Um, can you plus uh, next slide, please? Um, so before I go too in depth into this piece here, um, I want to talk a little bit about the technological infrastructure and the um, the name of that technological infrastructure in order to talk a little bit about the conceptual underpinnings of this work. Um, so the, the technological infrastructure is called Forista Inclusive. And the word Forista is the word I want you to focus on. So it appears in the laws of the Longobards and the capitularies of Charlemagne. Uh, the most likely origin is the Latin word foris, uh, meaning outside. So the obscure Latin verb forestare means to keep out, to place off limits, or to exclude. So the word forest implies being outside of civilization, the opposite, not part of a larger whole. So language is deeply intertwined with how we see the world, and in this case reveals a lot about how we, as English speakers, see the world and our relationships to the natural world. The concept of nature, or the forest, being separate from the body, echoes the underlying dualistic structure that we're all familiar with, man, woman, uh, body, mind, culture, nature. Um, and it's specific to Western, uh, the Western perspective, and it's resulted in a human nature dualism that has rendered nature as an insignificant other, a homogenized, voiceless, blank slate of existence, a perception of nature that helps justify the domination of the planet, um, as so eloquently put by Val Plumwood, who is an eco-feminist and a philosopher. So this project is really based on challenging this idea and finding ways of reintroducing the forest into formal consideration and denying the philosophy of exclusion that forms the basis of Western capitalistic views on nature. Next slide, please. So the Forista in inclusive infrastructure is consisting of three um, sensor pods and then there's a, a Wi-Fi hub. Next slide, please. Um, and so basically inside the sensor hubs, I have a number of sensors. They're connected to a microcontroller, which is an ESP. And the ESP just sends information online. Um, and so here, this is the, oh, don't, yeah, yeah. So this is the IoT prototyping platform that I'm using. And those black dots are basically information and they're sending information live. Next slide, please. And just click it one more time. Yeah, good, so now you can see it moving. And so once it's here, I can take the information anywhere in the world. So the infrastructure could be in a forest in Brazil, and uh, the in-gallery installation could be anywhere else on the planet. The information is sent live, and then, and then it's harvested again, and, you, and that data is materialized within whatever the, the exhibition is. Next slide, please. So this is the first iteration of the sensor hubs. Um, and I show you this because I want to talk first about the form. But here you can see the first form, which had a bunch of smaller forms that were very similar in size. Next slide, please. So um, I'm a sculptor. Uh, I love making objects. I love carving things. I love working with my hands. It's a very important part. And so I like having a material that I, uh, material metaphor that I'm working with. In this case, I was interested in um, a mutualistic symbiotic relationship as sort of the primary um, metaphor for all the works that I'm doing with this infrastructure. So mutualism is a type of sim, uh, symbiotic relationship, just like parasitic, where you have the, the host is killed by the symbiont. A mutualistic uh, symbiotic relationship is where the host and the symbiont um, both benefit from that relationship. So um, here is a termite, and that is a protozoa. So you can see the form of the object sim is very similar to the protozoal form. The uh, protozoa is a single-celled eukaryotic organism that lives inside of the, st the termite's stomach. So termites, surprisingly, aren't able to digest wood. It's actually the protozoa that, di that breaks down the cellulose, which allows the termite to thrive. So the protozoa provides the termite with, new, with sustenance and then the termite in exchange gives the protozoa a safe place to live. So that's one of the founding questions of this piece. It's clear we need nature for absolutely everything. What does it need from us? And perhaps it's stewardship and protection and care. Next slide, please. 
Oh, back, yeah. So generally what I do is I start off with my, my main metaphor and then I get to know it a little bit by drawing it. Um, I spend some time thinking about it and thinking about its form. Next slide, please. Um, so ultimately now you can see that they've moved away a little bit from the protozoan form, but they still reference it a little bit. Um, we cr I create them, or they are created in 3D models, uh, then I slice them, and then I laser cut, and you can see a 3D printed box in there that ho houses all the electronics, and then I carve it, sand it, and then I prepare it for installation. Next slide, please. So ultimately, this is what they look like. Uh, we've got three different types. I have uh, atmosphere pods, we've got air pods, and then we've got soil pods. Next slide, please. And then I install them on trees, and they look like little koala bears <laughs> hugging the trees. And so these guys, I, you know, can, I can install them for up to two months, um, and they run on batteries. Uh, this is at the Rare Charitable Reserve. Next slide, please. So one of the things I think when we're dealing with complex systems or distributed systems, it's really hard to get your head around what is this system and this thing exists somewhere else. So I really struggled with how do I tell the story. And so I decided, uh, so with this piece here, you'll notice that there's a point cloud of a tree. And so that's actually a LIDAR scan of the tree that the pods are connected to. So I worked with Dr. Derek Robinson from the Modeling and Spatial Analysis Lab, who actually has, next slide please, this very large drone. Next slide, please. And you can see that there's the LIDAR scanner on the bottom of that drone. So this is a very high tech, he, he's a, a geologist and so he uses it for mapping. So he scanned me by tree, and next slide please. And um, I get this large swatch and then we basically edit down and delete all the different um, pixels or the points that we don't want until we have the tree that uh, you can see represented here. Next slide please. So um, on the gallery side of what I showed here is extending towards. Next slide, please. Um, and so this is the installation as it exists here. Um, so I have my pods here. I brought in some sculptural versions of the, of the pods. Actually, those are the ones that were installed last summer. Um, and then we put them on the tree here. And then you've got a live reading of all the sensor data that's coming in. Um, and then you also have the other visualization. And so this other visualization, I based it kind of on tree rings. So it's, you, it's like, if, you know how you can date a tree every year, you've got a ring um, inside the trunk of a tree. Um, so I use that logic um, to create the visualization. Next slide, please. You're gonna have to hit it twice, one more time. There we go. And so this is the visualization, and you can see roughly that there's a number of rings as you move inwards. And so what I'm doing is I'm collecting all this data, so CO2, VOC, VOCs, wind data, light data, and um, I'm using that to affect either the whole thing or just the outer rim. Um, and you can see that you can move into the visualization. Um, and this, oh, no, go back. Okay, maybe hit it one more time. No. Um, okay, there. Okay, just don't don't move there. Yeah, I'll just keep on finishing up here. Anyway, so what I've done is I basically take all the data and then I shift it back every hour so that you basically got a record of the tree's life for 24 hours. And uh, so I use light or colored colored to represent the light data. So you can see this was yesterday's sun. Uh, yesterday, you can see yesterday's sunset. The blue is nighttime, and then the, the stuff on the edges is, is contemporary. And you can see if I move it over sideways that I've got the 24 hours of the data of the tree. So then in terms of interacting, I have, next slide please. Uh, oh, so this is the LIDAR, and so you can see that the, the lights, the colors also change. So the tree is set up live as well, and so this is nighttime, this is basically sunrise and sunset, and that's full daylight. And so right now you can see that the light is not, it's because it's raining in the visualization, you don't have a super bright day. Next slide, please. Um, and this is again, yeah. And so in terms of interacting with it, the interaction has, has meaning for me. I'm very interested in the idea of finding a place, a dialogical space or a space where both tree and person kind of have to come together and have a, sort of like we need to slow our bodies down and I've kind of extended the time of the tree. So next slide, please. 
Um, this is the interface, um, and at the very top, there's a leap motion, and when you put your hand on top, you're able to move inside the visualization. If you move too fast, you'll just sort of shoot through the visualization, and you won't be able to see very much, but if you slow your body down as much as possible and move very, very slowly, you can slowly enter into the visualization. So the idea is that you become tree, you slow yourself down in order to engage with this tree, which has also been kind of sped up, like we have the 24 hours. And so I was interested in that. Oh, I'm super on time. Okay, next slide, please. Um, I've also, the last component is that inside the sculpture, there is a bunch of water in the very bottom. I've just got two seconds left. No yeah. At the very bottom, uh, there's some water and there's an ionizer. And so I have Geosmin. And Geosmin is the scent of the forest. Um, and so basically, Geosmin was discovered in 65. It's a molecule that's created by a group of bacteria that live in soil. And every time it rains, the bacteria releases Geosmin. It aerosols, and that is the smell of the forest. It literally is that earthy, damp smell. And so I have it perfume smell. And so you, you'll notice when you come into the gallery, there's a really earthy smell. That's my scent sculpture. So every time it rains in the forest, it ionizes that scent, and then it releases it into the gallery. Next slide, please. And this is somebody at the opening uh, of the exhibition. And last slide, please. One more slide, yeah. And these are my acknowledgments for the many people who helped me put this thing together. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jane. I'm always totally blown away by your care and your attention to detail and your, your ability to, to do macro thinking and micro thinking and um, pull it all together. So thank you for that. I, I learned a lot from that and I thought I knew this piece really uh, well. Um, we're gonna pass it over to Joel. Uh, Joel is a media artist whose works connect scientific and artistic approaches to the environment developed from more than a decade of explorations in sound, installation, and socially conscious art. And again, his full bio is in the uh, exhibition brochure. Test. Okay, thank you. Hey, um, so my name is Joel, I'm happy this is, this is running, uh, and that is uh, my piece entitled, un, uh, entitled Untitled Interspecies in Velton. Um, the project Untitled Interspecies in Velton is an artistic research project uh, exploring expanded and computer-mediated experiences of conversations with the microalgae Euglena gracilis. Um, through strategies in data visualization, motion capture, and computer vision, the project proposes a speculative and interscalar intermingling of the natural and cultural worlds of biosemiotics and extraverbal language. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. As a work of research creation, the project explores the idea of the meta-organism, meta the microscopic or um, visualized body recontextualized as an object of knowledge or better a resource of information to be extracted and understood. As organisms around us are increasingly exploited, such biomedia is viewed as a new regenerative and malleable resourcing and participate often without consent in our interventions with their metabolic lives. Eben Kurtzky in his seminal book, The Multispecies Salon, questions what happens when the bodies of organisms and in even entire ecosystems are enlisted in the schemes of biotechnology and the dreams of biocapitalism. Next slide, please. But about the protagonist, the Euglena gracilis is a fascinating organism, at least to me it is. It's a single cell algae, it's very robust, uh, and it will conform its size and activity to its environment. Uh, it usually lives here in ponds uh, on scum at its surface, uh, and uh, it, it's usually also seen in large quantities of colonies. Um, over here is one single Euglena uh, that, I've, that I've been following. <laughs> I guess. Uh, this, is, this is somewhat uh, feedbacking. <clears throat> so the Euglena is, is phototactic, which means it moves towards the light, and it's photosynthetic, which means it uh, gets food from this, this light. But in addition to generating this energy from the sun, it also hunts and eats other cells like green algae and amoebas. Uh, by phagocytosis, so it kind of engulfs them. 
And so these characteristics have placed it in a very murky interstitial space uh, between animal and plant. Um, so it's you know, beyond taxonomic definition. And practically for this exhibition, it's been very, very um, uh, interesting also because it's, has, uh, it exhibits these responses to the environment at a scale that we can perceive. Um, it's literally um, you know, moving at a scale that we can, we can see even as it is you know, entirely microscopic. Um, so previous uses of euglena, uh, next slide please, uh, include uh, invoking its agency in bio games. Uh, you can't really see this um, maybe, but the slide on the top has the euglena uh, um, cast on a backdrop of a soccer field where its movements uh, are traced under a, a, a camera and uh, it's actually kicking a ball uh, towards a goalpost. Um, below it is PEC euglena, which is euglena that is uh, functioning as PEC man, um, moving through uh, um, a, a stage as well, eating these like lightly colored dots. Uh, and some have also started these experiments around moving euglena uh, forcefully, I would say, by, direct, by turning on lights in different parts of a, of a chip uh, and having the euglena move towards that. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, it's interesting that this is part uh, of a new frontier in this coalescing of biological and computational de decision-making systems uh, that, you know, you've also seen in insects and slime molds and other things like that. Uh, next slide, please. So for this project, uh, I aimed to expand my understanding of kinship. Uh, thinking about extraction uh, critically, uh, but also the idea of being with an organism that we're intending to perform with over time uh, towards an idea of promiscuous care. And this is something that has been, been talked about recently. Um, it's a mode of experimenting with a greater diversity of models of caring relationships beyond just the family or, or the market and establishing social infrastructures that support more capacious notions of non-discriminatory sorry, non-discriminatory caregiving practices, including first and foremost, understanding how to live with and who you're living with. Uh, so in this case, as you know, arguably we should kind of do this with every relationship we have. Um, uh, and so these are some, some early drawings about, you know, what is the euglena, what is the computer, and how do you actually sustain uh, life uh, outside of the pond? Um, in a manner reminiscent of early bio art pieces, including Adam Zaretsky's work called Zoo in 20, uh, 2001, placing the stakes of caregiving of living organisms side by side with the technological apparatus, and in this case also you know, training and maybe presenting of artificial life, amplifies the necessity for the active labor of care as a performance of vital maintenance, not just thinking about the performance of the system itself. On the other hand, introducing or projecting this notion of care to a machine-organism hybrid may seem unnecessary and superfluous, especially to an organism that's so small and exists in this post-perspectival space. Like, you can't see it, uh, you can't smell it, can't sm uh, taste it, touch it, uh, and it's also relatively, you may consider it inconsequential because there are so many of them, uh, and, uh, you know, is this really worth it? You know, the question is, what is the return of investment for the time and resources expanded into this project? Next slide, please. Um, to house the euglena safely, uh, I designed a new microfluidics chamber uh, for the euglena along with the help from the York Microfabrication Facility and Puyo Reza's lab, um, ACUTE, which is the Advanced Center for Microfluidics Technology and Engineering. Um, but we were focusing on a hospitable environment for the euglena in the gallery space. And we were focusing on increasing its mobility in this, in, as opposed to decreasing mobility. Typically in lab work, they try to isolate and kind of, uh, uh, um, how do you say, like, you know, make, make sure that the, the organism doesn't move so you can study it, right? Uh, in this case, we were thinking of increasing its motility, uh, mobility and with several performance stages as well uh, that uh, the euglena could opt in and stay if it wants to come in and out. So that's the final uh, piece on the right, uh, the top, that's what we printed, and this is a, a, a little slide showing what it looks like under the microscope. Next slide, please. Um, at the same time, you know, this notion of care kind of brought me full circle to thinking also about care of humans, uh, myself included, and you know, like when you're an artist and you're working for a deadline, a lot of times you don't care very much about your, your own well-being, 
uh, and this was an interesting experiment in trying to, to balance uh, the notions of care across uh, everything that I was in experiencing in the last uh, you know, six to eight months as we were preparing for this, including the exhibition itself. Uh, so I, I, I was thinking a lot about uh, these forgotten ideas of Chinese medicine that you know, I kind of grew up with uh, and how they can in be incorporated at least aesthetically through the ideas of flows of energy, you know, the idea of qi, the idea of um, the this, this substrate of, of, um, of air that we all uh, kind of move within and that we breathe in and inhale and exhale. Uh, and things like that. So circles became very evidently um, um, important to this project too. Uh, next piece, please. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, during the exhibition, it was a really unpredictable journey and sometimes you would see the Euglena would be totally absent uh, from the stages if it decided to go somewhere else. And sometimes it would be totally um, still. It wouldn't be moving at all. And sometimes that's because of a, a stressor in the environment. For instance, if it ran out of water, uh, it wouldn't move, uh, wouldn't be able to swim. Um, but also sometimes maybe it just wasn't feeling like moving. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, when I started the exhibition, I, I pumped in quite a bit of euglena because I, I didn't really know how much was the right amount and um, they grew uh, and they reproduced. <laughs> and, uh, and then they ended up clogging the, the entire chip. Um, so I had to make uh, a new chip to house them. Um, and, and this was interesting. Uh, next slide, please. Now, something that was, um, in the course of learning more about the euglena, I've also had to deal with the notion of, of death. Um, and I've had many pets before, and you know, you always have this notion of an individualized relationship with your pet, which is very one-to-one, -one, even if you have multiple pets, as I did. But this form of herd care is somewhat different. And so when I first saw this, this is a learning slide that Carolina Biological sends out with their euglena packs. Uh, and it's about showing you the form of euglena basically fixed on a, pl on, a, on a microscopic plate. And a lot of these euglena are dead. So it's basically a mass graveyard uh, of these. And I had an overwhelming sense of grief, you know, and, uh, you know, this, and it's also a very violent death because this is like its guts got spilled out. It's a process um, known as autoproteolysis where it, it splits and, and, and all its proteins just spill out. Um, and so, but, but you know, I, I've been reminded um, about uh, Donna Haraway's ideas of death and, you know, returning to this deeper level of symbiosis where she says, I am vastly outnumbered by my tiny companions. Better put, I become an adult human being in company with these tiny messmates. To be one is always to become with many. I love that when I die, all these benign and dangerous symbionts will take over and use whatever is left of my body, if only for a while, since we are necessary to one another in real time. And this has really helped me with the cycles of life and death within this project, and also shaped how a potential death ritual might work within this context. Um, it's also been, uh, last slide, uh, next slide, please. It's also interesting to note that this project's been presented in uh, different prior forms. Uh, one is a visualization that triggers uh, personal poems, artifacts of my own memory, as well as another where the Euglena uh, has been in collaboration with a fine-tuned uh, GPT-2 chat, GPT chatbot uh, as a conversationalist in a Zoom presentation on the right at uh, the Politics of the Machine conference a couple of years ago. Um, last slide. Uh, so I will end with uh, an idea um, that you know, has been percolating through my artist artistic work around motion capture and, 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 and dancing, you know, this oscillation between verbal and nonverbal texts. And I'll leave you with a quote from Donna Meadows, uh, you know, the great biophysicist and cybernetician, where she says, we can't impose our will upon a system. We can listen to what the system tells us and discover how its properties and our values can work together to bring forth something much better than ever could be produced by our will alone. We can't control them or figure them out, but we can dance with them. Thank you. I think I'm, I think I'm good, thanks. Yeah. There's so much there in that one little Eugenia to, I, I really, really appreciate your bravery and uh, curiosity and, and bringing it into so many different contexts, you know, of, of care and of life and death and of agency. And there's, there's it, a lot there. Um, I've got questions too. <laughs> no. And let's pass it over now to, um, 
Dolin Atisawa Ashi, Manning, and Mary Bunch. We've got them uh, live online. Uh, Dolin is an interdisciplinary artist and a Queen's National Scholar in Anishinaabe Language, Knowledge, and Culture in the Department of Philosophy and Cultural Studies at Queen's University. Mary is a media artist, Canada Research Chair, and Associate Professor of Cinema and Media Arts at York University. And again, their bios are in the free publication that you can grab in so many places around the gallery. So I'll pass it over to uh, Mary and Jolene. Um, hi, thanks so much for having us here. I'm sorry that we're not actually present with you. We're very close by, but um, you know, there was we were we were in the company of a tiny microorganism shared through respiratory um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, practices uh, last night. We a friend called us this morning that we've been out with last night who tested positive for COVID this morning. So we thought it best not to um, continue proliferating that life form among you all today. So we're very close by, but we're not we're not quite with you. Um, uh, so we're each going to talk for about five minutes. I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about the context and, um, you know, the creation of this piece. And Dolene's going to talk uh, more about the underlying concept because the, the work is really based on uh, her philosophical work uh, in an Anishinaabe philosophy. Um, but it's also a conversation between the two of us and a conversation that we've been having in several forms between uh, concepts of worlding from, from her Anishinaabe perspective and world making um, in media arts, in philosophy, in queer theory. And uh, this piece uh, kind of sets up that conversation um, and continues that conversation and um, extends it also to discussions with Western science and the world of the microscope. So I'm gonna, I'm going to go through a, I have a series of slides, mostly with moving images to, to talk about, um, including including some examples of earliest or earlier renditions of this work. So this one, some of you might recognize, this was the first version of the work that we made, which was um, the, the beta version that exhibited at the Renewal exhibition um, that Joel Ong was one of the curators for. So there's some great interconnections to in, in the sort of evolution of this work in relation to this, uh, this exhibition. Jane was one of the exhibiting artists in that exhibition as well. And um, Dolene and I had been working on a project um, that, uh, a MITAX project called Earth Diver Land Based Worlding that she's a principal investigator for, um, that was working in the space of Second Life at the beginning, which was a place that we had been teaching during COVID. And Joel invited us to bring something to that exhibition. So we were really thinking about how the, the kind of work we were doing around land based worlding within Second Life might be translated into the Mozilla Hubs platform. So we did the, our first kind of prototype of this world in Mozilla Hubs, which was an amazing kind of making space that we were able to access and um, and and do our own our own um, our own making. I'm going to turn that sound down a little bit. I imagine it might be blowing me out. Um, so we were talking about the microscopic and the macro in ways that, uh, again, Dolene will expand on in a little while. And we realized within hubs that we could create these spheres and these planets. So we built this, this world that was uh, a microscopic world contained within a drop of water. And these are all found images of um, water life microscopically. So within it, you can see that there's some protozoa swimming around. There's um, various kinds like 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 sort of tadpole like zygotes. Um, the the kind of swirly one is a, a water lily bud that's been um, when there's a cross section. So we found these online. Um, we took them into Mozilla Hubs and we transformed them into planets. And although you can't see it on this video, uh, when you're inside the space, you could fly right inside the planet and be inside. It's kind of like a portal to another world, the world of that microscopic creature. Um, two of the worlds were story worlds created by guest artists, um, students that we're working with, research creation students, um, Marielle Belanger, um, the one that you can kind of see that's a black spinning ball, that's her work. We, we have another video that we can show you a bit of 
of that work later. Um, Hodari Clark, who is a hip hop artist and rapper, um, he created a, a rap with um, Mona Stonefish, who's uh, an Anishinaabe elder, and she she read a poem in Anishinaabe Muin, and the the that rap was based on the the work of Cree biologist Lydia Johnson. So there was kind of a bit of a curation happening within the space as well as it being an artwork on its own. And um, we 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 loved the Mozilla Hub's form. It was also networked, so several people could be in there at once. But uh, it was very glitchy and it kept crashing. So then we thought about maybe switching to Unreal Engine. Again, I'm going to shut this down. down. Um, so we continued to develop it. And now we started working with uh, uh, a team of technicians, um, RAs, um, talented people from the, the, the Cinema and Media Arts Program. I, I have their names on the next slide, actually. Um, so uh, you, you'll see that in a second. Um, and so we recreated the, the space in Unreal and we exhibited at Nuit Blanche as a dome projection. So we're one of the things that we're interested in experimenting, experimenting with is these um, sort of different screens, different um, technologies of vision and the different ways that we can, we can see through those. Um, the microscope, which you'll see in our, our installation here at the gallery, um, cause our, our, the, the iteration that you can see today is, um, is our own original microscopy, which we kind of, after, after this one with all the found images, we, we borrowed the media arts video microscope and learned how to use it because we had no idea how to use it. Um, spend a summer looking at water samples from the, the, the wetlands close to us on the St. Lawrence river, um, and captured our own footage. Um, and really started thinking about that conversation also in terms of um, those those early scientists who were doing my, microscopy, uh, people like Leibniz and, um, and, and Robert Hooke, uh, who in the 16th century, when the microscope was invented at a similar time as sort of colonization was happening here in the Americas, they're discovering this other new world in the world of the microscope that's really challenging Western philosophical concepts and the kind of notion of substances and the idea that substances are solid, um, the kind of primacy of, of vision and of, of what we can see with the naked eye being what constitutes reality and all of the ways that's connected to hierarchical Christian um, understandings of existence. And when they peer through the microscope, their minds are completely blown at these magical worlds that they had no idea existed. And one of the conversations that we had about that was, you know, at the same time as they're encountering these, these levels of reality, these experiences that, that Christendom had no idea existed in this way, they're also encountering indigenous peoples in the Americas who have these alternate philosophies, these other ways of understanding existence. And because of the colonial mentality, because of the power dynamics, um, the conversation that might have happened uh, in that space never happened in, until now, really, in, in the kinds of discussions that we're having in this exhibition um, and these expanded understandings of, um, you know, of, of existence and also of um, these notions of the more than human that are, that are at stake here. So we wanted to have the microscope right in the exhibition so that viewers, so the audience members could, um, could discover their own worlds and have that kind of experience that Leibniz had in the 16th century, gazing through that microscope, seeing these worlds and thinking about what that means for their own relationship to, to other forms of life. So here's some examples of our own original microscopy. Um, there's a protozoa, that little one is a rotifer, I think, of some sort. Um, and then the larger one is a kind of worm. This is one of the, the images that, that appears in the work um, with a sound piece that's attached to it. I'm gonna go quickly, I think, because I, I meant to turn my timer on and forgot, so I have no idea where I am. Um, here's another example. Um, really, really fascinating watching the interactions between the, the different life forms. I didn't notice until I was putting this slideshow together that these protozoa are actually um, pushing that rotifer out of their space, like they're, they're, they're ganging up on it. And um, 
moving him away. They're, they're uh, really fascinating relationships happening in these microscopic worlds. This is the, the world that's, that's in the more than human exhibition featuring our own mic microscopy. I'll let you listen to it. It seems like sorry i'm just trying to sound back down um so i would suggest when you try out when you're going to look at that work use the the controllers with your hands and the thumb toggles and you can fly right inside of those planets and it's like they open up as as a kind of other world around you um, but i know i'm probably taking up all our time so i'm going to turn it over to delene at this point um to talk about really the the concept that underlies that um that she's been developing in her in in the in her field of philosophy which, which um, you, one do you want me to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, maybe, maybe we'll, this is, we'll skip Nadeau, the, or Marielle's piece, and we'll move right on to, to Nadeau worlding. Uh, okay, well, I actually, we, we can go back to Marielle's just for a second. We can go bring that. This is um, <clears throat> Marielle Belanger's um, it seems like they waited a long, long, long time and still nothing. The tailed one didn't come. The tailed one was losing power, so they began seeing in their head. Okay, you can stop it. So with this piece, um, <clears throat> this is actually not the, um, uh, Marielle's piece is not presented in the work at um, on-site gallery right now. So this was a, is a series. Um, so we were really conceiving of this project as both a digital gallery and an artwork in itself. And a uh, uh, part of responsibility of um, um, faculty, um, and we're both professors at universities, she's at York, I'm at Queens, is to, um, you're, you're responsible to your students to create opportunities for them. Um, and so we've had, I think this was um, where Mary L's piece is, uh, that was the, um, the, the beta, the, the first one that we created. And so for the beta version, Mary, Mary and I both, we, we created that together and we, you know, fooled around with it and, and learned the technology. It was uh, <clears throat> difficult, <laughs> but we got it. <laughs> And uh, and that piece, like where it was located, it was like it was quite heavy to have a lot of video. So we uh, uh, lobbed, you know, to have uh, student works that are uh, we wanted to um, uh, uh, present their work as uh, highlighting uh, pieces in that in that initial um, exhibition. We'll say digital exhibition, and uh, <clears throat> and then we have. Um, and we have the second piece that was shown at um, at York, the uh, Nuit Blanche, and um, uh, Marielle and and Hadari and Lydia on a stonefish. Um, their piece was also um, in that that second iteration. And what you're seeing here in the gallery, other than him uh, on on site, is uh, a piece that's um, that um, Mary and I we both. Um, conceived of the the digital gallery space, the, the microscopic world. Plus, we did um, the uh, all the video work and and uh, the um, gathering those images from our from the water from where we currently are living. Um, 
And then uh, you would maybe show that piece with the um, wheel sound again. So with the, one of the things I was thinking of is that with the micro and the macros, uh, thinking about the idea of our relationship between these these um, structures. So on the one hand, so although this one, you can maybe play just a little sound of the um, wheel sound, um, like uh, so for also. Even though those are, you can shut that. Now, the, even though those are, they're just, they're microscopic. You can't see them with the naked eye. We're making a relationship to whales and talking about this, uh, this movement, this expansion and contraction between the microscopic and the macro. And, uh, and we often, um, in a human-centric uh, framework, don't think about what we can't see or that we, are we, um, uh, present our, our our reality, our perspectives as the uh, primary or most important perspective. So here we're trying to uh, um, make that link or make you know make that evident um, that our relationship and our dependence um, on um, these different these different worlds that we're not necessarily uh, consciously privy privy to without such a thing as these these technologies of uh, a microscope, for example. Um, but also, like Mary brought up, the protozoa and a rotifer that were, you know, they're pushing each other around, you know. So also there's the, we want to acknowledge like this tension between, uh, it, you know, these different, um, these different um, uh, beings and their, and, and, and dissension, right? So it's not, you know, collaboration is, is a difficult thing if it's ever even a, achievable. Um, so it's, um, so these relationships, they're not always um, uh, uh, love and roses. There's always, <laughs> there's, there's a, a tension that we have to um, uh, live alongside and, and figure out how, how to uh, be together in a, in, in a way that we, is, um, um, we're open to each other. Um, <clears throat> so it's always a, a negotiation, really. And um, <clears throat> for Nido Whirling, um, oh, you can play the um, next uh, with it. Uh, so I, I was, I used the uh, images of uh, uh, the, um, the starlings, murmurating starlings, which is actually mur a murmuration. It talks actually about the sound they make when they're when they're flocking together, which is that they sound like a, you know a crowd that are murmuring. Um, that was it. That's what that um, that term. And you can see here in the images um, uh, these birds that are they're um, in a murmuration. Um, <clears throat> on the one hand. Um, well, you know, from the literature that uh, we both read, that it's um, scientists say eh? <laughs> that that they're on the one hand they're creating like this large body to to kind of fool predators into um, into thinking that there uh, there's this uh, a, a mass a massive uh, entity, and on the other hand that they say that they're they're always trying to fly into the center to avoid um, predators. And uh, and the same thing of um, uh, schooling fish. Um, but at the same hand, one of the things that I, I feel as though um, that they're not really making count for us is that, uh, that they're just doing it for pure joy, right? That there's just uh, um, uh, uh, a love and this synchronicity of the movement between um, the airflow, the air current, and uh, the water current, and uh, and they're moving bodies together that they that they ignite one another. Um, <clears throat> and that uh, you know, I was really when I was talking about these um, the uh, murmuring birds and the flocking birds and the school of fish, I was also uh, really talking about this uh, Nido worlding, as in. Uh, in the, in the West, we there's always the idea that uh, um, that the of the uh, human subject is the purveyor of truth and and uh, uh, knowledge and and uh, and it, and it's a hierarchical structure where humans are at the pinnacle, 
Um, whereas for Anishinaabe, that is not the case as a, uh, I, uh, I'm Anishinaabe. And uh, <clears throat> that is uh, um, non-hierarchical. So rather than just think of uh, that, that um, humans are, are have uh, um, the uh, final say <laughs> on, on what is reality, due to our, the, uh, undoubtedly this brilliant mind that we have, um, but for for us, we understand that humans have come, come here last. That um, absolutely everything in existence is um, <clears throat> there are ancestors. Um, Maris brought this. Um, this uh, I, I'm not even going to try to uh, pronounce it. Maybe Mary can do that. But <laughs> this this um, scary looking. Uh, um, and, and this this um, entity is about the size of a grain, uh, grain of sand, actually. So you can Dolene, we've lost your sound. I think. Um... Sorry about that. So we, we lost uh, about a there? minute, and we've probably got about a minute left, and then we should uh, move on to the questions. So I don't know if you can wrap up, and uh, but let's see if we can hear you again, Dolene. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry what about. What was the last thing? What was the last thing you could hear? Grain of sand. Oh, okay. So yeah, that um, this uh, this entity is, I believe, it's extinct. And we first understood it. Uh, it was the um, um, the first um, ancestor of, of humans, or all, all vertebrates, and including humans. Um, but we just didn't choose it because it just aesthetically didn't didn't look very good as a, a planet. But, <laughs> but we also then found some other research that says that maybe um, it's not actually um, the one of the, the first um, ancestors of, of humans, but rather crayfish and insects or something like that. So, but yeah, but just again, this movement back and forth, in particular thinking also about um, COVID. So the relationship between the microscopic um, such as COVID, that have the ability to do what no other human government in the world was able to do, which is to completely uh, stop um, mass human travel, uh, technological pollution, those kinds of things in that um, <clears throat> that take us like completely, like no matter what we do, these, these microscopic um, agencies have far more um, power and um, ability than we do. Uh, <clears throat> but oh my god, should we all go to um, questions now? Great. Migwitch, Dolene, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you to Mary. Um, this exhibition, you know, like you're, you're, I'm, listening and, and thinking so much about perspective, you know, and how difficult it is in, in some ways to change perspective. And, um, and uh, your, your talk just kind of left me a lot with um, your talk and the whole exhibition, you know, it, it's like this exhibition is really slow I in a way. And I've been very privileged because I work here. So I, I can, you know, I often, especially if I'm feeling a little, down, I'll like spend a good 15 minutes with the piece because it's like the embodiment that comes from, you kind of have to absorb these pieces with your body as well. So, um, and I did want to point out that um, Mary and Dolene's piece is in this little alcove right here. So um, just for, in case you uh, didn't catch that. But yeah, let's get to questions. Sorry, I'm ruminating, but it left me with, you know, I love even the, the, the presentations are leaving me with um, 
a feeling in my body as as well as with um, you know all of this intellectual knowledge and it, it's it's been a real elastic kind of learning um, you know for me when you know I'm not engaged in the same depth a, as you are and, and focused with everything on your practices. Um, so the first question that I want to ask, and, and Mary and Dolene, you can hear us uh, just fine? Okay, great. And I don't know if, um, for your mic, you, you just have to turn it, here, I'll do it. Okay. It's, it's got two. Can you see us as well? Mary and Dolene, yes. yeah? Yeah, we can see you. Okay, great. So speaking from a Western capitalistic framework, which is where we find ourselves. It is evident due to the climate crisis and many other reasons that we need to rethink and reshape our relationship to the natural world, even though, I mean, we are part of the natural world, but of the way it, we're often talking about it. How do you think that artworks, such as the works in this exhibition, contribute to a remapping and rethinking of this relationship? I'll let anyone I could call on. I, I'm going to call on you, Jane, to start this one, and then. Oh, sorry, I'm calling on Joel. <laughs> here, here, here. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay. Okay. On that note of exploitation. <laughs> um, well, I think it's interesting also because, um, uh, com I mean, I wouldn't identify it necessarily with a, a Western cap capitalist model. Um, and, but growing up in, in Asia, I've definitely been uh, looking at the, the way everything is being industrialized uh, in a very, 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 very uh, rapid pace. Uh, and something like the Euglena, for instance, that is being touted as the next spirulina uh, and being harvested in large quantities. The moment there's a spark of an idea, uh, you know, it, it, it becomes um, industrialized almost immediately. Uh, and there are factories now that are growing this stuff and, and grinding it into powder um, before, uh, I guess, adequate research is being done on its effects on the human body. But this is, this is happening, right? Uh, so th it's a good question. And, and the idea also about biocapitalism, you know, you know, starting to work with organisms that don't, are not able to speak for themselves, you know, taking things out of their natural environments and putting them in, in spheres that are otherwise inhospitable for them. Um, I, I feel that through this project, you know, it's really important uh, if we're doing something to understand what the life and the death cycle of something is. And I, and I think this is something, you know, Dolene, you, you've actually, in some of our, our conversations in, in the past as well, this is something that has, that has come up also, you know, how do you leave something uh, better than it was in a space? Uh, but also, how do you understand its life and death cycles within their natural environments, and how can we do our best to ensure that those continue? Me? Say that again. I'm sorry, was that a question to me, Joel? No, I or think was it was... Uh, I, I was actually passing this on, so you're up, Dolene. <laughs> I don't know which camera no. you can see us from. Uh, maybe I'll come back to that, your question <laughs> later. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, well, I guess I'll answer. Um, whose question was it? Lisa's. Lisa's. Okay. So, I guess um, Lisa, um, in particularly to do with uh, Western capitalist frameworks. Um, uh, frankly, I'm, I'm, I am actually really skeptical of this, this kind of work actually being able to do the work of changing human relationships uh, um, to the natural environment um, and, and in relation to, um, uh, that is the, a change within a Western resource extractive structure, uh, which is that we're all implicated in and it's so embedded and you know, like uh, uh, even as artists, there's um, in art institutions, there's so much waste produced um, in in making and sustaining our art and our art practice, right? Like, uh, and I think some of the other panelists in different um, um, sessions discussed that that um, 
kind of waste and uh, ethical um, query that they're left with, like, you know, like traveling to a different country to do research, right, uh, as just one example. But uh, um, in particular, I'm gonna get a longer answer this and I'll, and I'll probably, you know, I'll take my time and not, not answer the other ones in such length. But um, uh, like since speaking as an Ishnaba, I know that these more than human concepts are thousands of years old. They're um, foundational global indigenous knowledges. And uh, such projects as this, you know, that's happening in this exhibition, for example, uh, are the uh, projects that take up the uh, more than human. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, because these are indigenous uh, concepts, um, that I feel they must always acknowledge these indigenous roots and engage with indigenous decolonizing initiatives. To do otherwise, I believe, continues to support settler colonial, colonial imperatives and capitalism. And it, um, further, it puts indigenous peoples, it continues to put them under erasure uh, for not acknowledging this contribution, this significant contribution, uh, which, in, you know, for the past 500 years, uh, our people have been um, jailed and criminalized, uh, put into all kinds of institutions because, because of this very um, philosophy. So I worry that, um, that it might be a bit of a fad on one hand and a, a, a seduction of the so-called new as with new materialism. What I, I mean by this is that such concepts are often presented as making theoretically original contributions. And I'm speaking about academic scholarship in particular here, such as with post-humanism. Um, the idea of the original, novel, or the new, again, supports notions of human exceptionalism and the idea of individualism and uh, artist genius. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, but yet, on the other hand, <laughs> I'm also part of uh, theoretical and creative communities that are informed by these concepts. Um, <clears throat> and I'm often shocked when I meet people who are unaware of uh, more than human, other than human interrelational concepts. So um, in fact, this kind of work does does do the work of educating, bringing awareness, and ultimately, hopefully, social change. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, and I would say, you know, again, thinking about those kinds of concepts, it's in, in, with the works in this exhibition, uh, for example, there, many of the artists talk about this collaborative, um, this collaborative relationship with that, with, it, with these different uh, living, um, what was call them people, like these you know, with our little protozoas, uh, for example, or um, with other scientists or other disciplines. Uh, so I think it's complicated, and I think, um, but I really, I, I, I absolutely am adamant that um, it, it must, this kind of work and the thinkers and the artists in this field, they absolutely must be acknowledging the indigenous roots of these concepts which yeah. thank you so much i um you know quickly a, a few things I, I totally agree with you on the acknowledgement and then just from my personal experience i've been going through a little bit of this journey of, of shifting my perspective and it really did start by looking at indigenous artworks and um and uh and then realizing at a certain point in my own curatorial research that I wanted to try to embody this knowledge rather than just have it living in my head, which was great, but not so great if, you know, certain, it just wasn't, you know, I'm, I'm more than my head, we're, we're bodies and, and we're all in relations. So, you know, ended up as a research doing a, um, a, uh, a year long, program to become a certified uh, nature and forest therapist, really starting it as, as research. And, and so I do look at 
like there has been a progress and it, 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 you know, starting from someone that I, f I remember the first time someone said to me, you know, collaboration with more than human, I, like I, it took me a long time to just even understand the concept. So I'm just bringing forth my personal experience of it, feel like, like a five year process that has radically transformed the way that I am in life. Like there is some hope, <laughs> you know, I, I, there, you know I, I believe it from my experience and I also see it in, in a lot of our students and, and people just hopefully it's <laughs> quick enough um, to, uh, um, I'm going to pass it over to Jane. I can tell Jane is like chomping, a which is, you know, yeah. it's like, I want to hear what you got to say. No, I wanted to thank you very much for your comments, Deline. Um, it's, so I've got a two part answer to, or two parts, two part thought about this. Um, so specifically to address Deline's point, um, when I started work, like, so I'm a media artist, I've been working this way for a long time, and I really believe in the ability for new media artwork to tell stories. I feel that um, it's, it's very, I feel as though it's, it's easier to tell stories that challenge people if, we, if they're experiential, if they're sensorial. I feel as though when information comes through the body versus intellectually through the mind only, we tend to be more receptive. And so I feel as though new media is in a really interesting position to create this space where we can, we get information through multiple modes. And so therefore we start to be able, we're able to shift perspective and think differently. So I think that that's one thing that new media has with it. Um, but when I started working this way, it became really evident to me that this discussion was so very political and it was so completely tied to colonialism, it was tied to a lot of violence and that it's not just a simple, here's my new media artwork. And so that's actually why I went into curating this exhibition because I didn't feel as though my work could do the job that I wanted more than what I wanted. I wanted, I realized there was different voices. I needed to actually get other artists who speak much more eloquently than I do or who come from perspectives that I don't have. And so that's actually why I started to curate this exhibition because I wanted to assemble a group of artists who were coming from different backgrounds um, and who had different perspectives to tell the story. So hopefully that when a public comes in, they're going from space to space and they're, they're sort of exposed to a number of different experiences that come from different perspectives. And so I do believe, maybe I'm an idealist, but I do believe that the new media artworks have that ability and if you come into an exhibition such as this, that hopefully you're, for, you're, you're sort of brought into another way of thinking and um, hopefully the ideas create a really rich experience that shift your perspective because really it's it's about a shifting that we need to do it's an urgent cultural project and this is not and we're running out of time sort of thing and so the shifting needs to happen and we need to start listening to voices such as indigenous voices uh, that have been silenced for a very long time and i do believe that that's the 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 way forward so yeah, I mean, definitely nature teaches us diversity makes us strong, right? And uh, so, uh, Mary, did you want to add? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm picking up some of what, what Jane is talking about in my answer. And, you know, in thinking about this question, I was really thinking about, I mean, media arts, um, arts more generally about why, why it's so important in terms of changing um, the way we think. And um, I was thinking about the social imaginary and the, the, the power that the image has. And so it's kind of like what Jane was talking about in terms of, like, it's not necessarily our ideas um, that are, aren't always the place where change can happen. But the social imaginary is like defined as the capacity, uh, it's a kind of social imagination that possesses us, not as individuals, but as a society. And it defines the parameters of what we believe is possible. And when I think, when I was teaching, I was teaching a class on world making when I was working at McGill and it denoted this, this group of students who had these, they were very committed to social change and social justice. It was a gender, sexuality and feminist context. 
and they could they were all vehemently anti-capitalist but when i asked them to start designing worlds and we were we were drawing worlds on on mural paper bringing in philosophy bringing in all these different concepts and when we actually tried to think about what a world might look like that didn't that was not a capitalist world they were totally stumped and there was this sort of failure of the imagination they could not imagine a different way of living a different way of being in the world even though they were so committed to it um, because um, because of the, the kind of the way that the kind of media that saturates their lives, the kinds of stories that they have access to, the kinds of images that they have access to. Um, and so, you know, working with Dolene, we're, you know, we're always in this conversation that is underscored by the paradynamics of settler colonialism and the importance of engaging with um, discourses of others and in a way that, that really hears those, those others without crossing that line where you're appropriating the thought like 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 so so trying to negotiate what is it to be in conversation what is it to um to be shifted to be moved in a within power dynamics in which <laughs> in which you come you know you're when you're in that dominant power position i love that like yeah the the, the um <laughs> the illusion of being in two separate spaces when really we're sitting right beside each other because <laughs> we were supposed to be there we're, we're at the OCAD hotel the OCAD condo <laughs> um, so that's one of the ways you know I think like I think art has the capacity to help people shift because it communicates to us on the level of the image and thinkers like um, Carlos Castoriadis who who kind of he, he's an Italian philosopher who was writing in the 70s, um, who was kind of bringing together Marxist theory and Lacanian theory and talking about, um, rather than talking about the idea and the ideology, he talked about the image, the imaginary and the capacity of the image to bring forth newness into the world in some way. Um, and in part, it's because the, the image grasps us at the level of the imagination, of of the way we imagine possibility, as opposed to uh, grabbing us at the level of the concept or the idea, which often gets attached to belief. So the, the social imaginary is kind of like a hegemonic concept in a way, but instead of within the realm of ideas, being in the realm of that imagination. And I'm, I'm really interested in seeing the world change, in um, having something different happen in the world. And I think when we, when we think through that in these sensory ways, in these ways that are embodied and connected to images, um, it affects us at that level of, I don't know, I, I don't want to call it hope exactly, but I guess a kind of radical hope where um, if our world is filled with conversations like this, that um, the generations that follow us might see that something else is possible rather than being, you know, living in the kind of despair that many young people seem to be inhabiting today. And then to act on it, right? To, to the, the praxis that, that then is attached to um, that social imaginary. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like hope, I think the definition in it, it is, uh, it included with having agency, like that, you know, you know that something can change. Um, um, my next question is, in many ways, the works in the show decenter the human, focus on relational and foreground stories that are unfolding around us and that are not necessarily about us. Can each one of you talk a little bit about your artworks in relation to this idea of decentering humans? I'll give it a try. Um, yeah, I was thinking about this question in relation to uh, the piece extending towards. And I think uh, I'm not, I think a lot of other works in this show decenter the human better than this particular piece does. Um, but I am interested in pushing the human over um, and creating space for something else that isn't just about 
the human. Um, but at the same time, the piece itself is very, really about that relationship between the human body and the sort of tree body. So I think that I'd be really curious to hear how other people answer the question more so than me. Uh, Mary or Darlene, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I think we did all the talking. We are, or should be um, somebody else who gives someone else a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't want to. Uh, I guess it's it's, it's, it's you, Joe. Yeah, well, um, so so interestingly in, in, enough, I mean, I I think that my my project's called Untitled Interspecies Umwelt, and for a number of reasons, the Umwelt. Um, is a, a biosemiotical complex, uh, con uh, concept uh, by von Utzkul, uh where he thinks about the perceptual sphere of a, another organism that you cannot access. Uh, and so trying to access that in itself is a very Sisyphean type you know, of strategy, like you, know, you will never be able to feel somebody else's pain because you're not in that body and you're not in that seat of perception, right? So also the idea of having it be untitled you know, is, is Ironic because it is a title, but it, you know it's like no label being a label, you know. Um, but uh, you know the 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 ownership, like where is the ownership? And and for me, decentering the human uh, has a very technological aspect to it. Um, uh, one one of my uh, earlier uh, uh, works or explorations was really in nanotechnology and and these real large assemblages of, of technology that would see for you on your behalf, that would hear for you on your behalf. So as the scientist says, this is my research and this is my experimentation, what they're actually saying is, you know, I have given the control of a lot of these parameters to these machinic forces. And you're seeing that more and more in today's world, obviously, with artificial life. But it was it. one funny anecdote was when Mary and Dolin actually came to install their works, and we were here on the same time, the first thing Dolin said to me was, what are you compensating for over there with your microscope? You know? Because, <laughs> I don't know, you, you might realize that my microscope is bigger than hers. Uh, <laughs> so, I know, you know, and it was, it was funny, but it was like, what is the minimum amount of, of technolo technology um, do you need to have to be able to start answering the questions that you have about other organisms? And this is, I guess, a growing, um, you know, decentralization process that is happening, that we are understanding more and more that the assemblage is, I guess, not so much about, like, giving away control or, or understanding or recognizing that the control is not really ours, but it's in really trying to govern or trying to understand this the circular natures of where control is and where they actually are invisible and hidden and, and how to see what that happens uh, to the system. I'm gonna jump in for, oh. I think I'm on, yep. For a second, just, um, you know, it's like each piece in a, in a different way feels like the, um, a, an experiment in the way of, of um, decentering humans. I think each piece is, is doing it in, in, in different contexts. And, um, um, and Jane, when you were talking um, in your presentation about um, you know, using the senses and, and, and about the, uh, the shapes of your, um, the pieces there and, and your love of like carving and that physical I engagement as well, you know, um, you know I, I feel like all of these processes that all of the artists here are, are going through, and I think many of us in, in different ways are going through in our, in our lives of, um, you know, trying not to be um, products. And, and um, you know, there, it's, a, it's very political in a, in a way to, to really... Um, shift to the way that you're seeing the world and, and allowing these other beings to teach you and not really knowing what that teaching is or, or how to absorb it or where it will get you. And, and that's why I think there's a lot of bravery when I said, you know, because I, 
you know, hesitate to talk in this way because it's like, I, I just feel like, you know, it's, it's kind of a little woo-woo. And, you know, so if I say like, you know, oh, spending so much time that I've been doing, like feeling trees and smelling the earth and having some kind of trust that that's going to change my perception of being in the world, um, you know, which it deeply has, like, is a different way of researching it and giving it that title of research to validate it in a way is um, important. And, and so it, it feels um, that we have a lot to learn. And, and it's those kind of, you know, experiments that I'm starting to have a result with physically um, and see it, you know, in different contexts of, of everyone's work here. It's, uh, if we can, as viewers of the work, you know, if you can, like, give yourself at some point, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to really be with the work and think about your senses in different ways with it, you, you know, I think you'll get a, a, a really interesting feedback from all of the information y you bring to it as well. Sorry, I just had to kind of get that out. I was getting excited. <laughs> Can I just add something? Or maybe Mary and Dolene want to speak before I add anything? Um, well, I have something to say, but I don't mind if, if you want to go first. That's fine with me. Yeah, go ahead. Answered. So just go ahead, and then I, if, if I can still remember, I'll, I'll no, say. Oh, no. Go ahead, Jane. I don't want you to forget. We're all so polite, Jane. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. No. Anyway. Um, no. I was just thinking about decentering the human in an exhibition that was created for humans. I don't know. There was just something about that that I found really hard to answer. Um, and I think that. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. There's just something there. I mean, each. But they're telling stories, and I think this is the interesting thing about the artworks here, is that they're t telling the stories that are happening with or without us. And I think that in itself decenters the human. But at the end of the day, we're trying to, you know, change, we're trying to get the human <laughs> to think differently. So in a certain way, there is a centering uh, that happens with an exhibition like this. So there's just something, there's a play that, happen that happens there. So we're asking people to imagine for just one moment that you're not the center of the universe. And each artwork does that differently, I think, in, the art, in this exhibition. And then just to circle back to what you said before about is the role one of care, is the, is the role, you know, if, is that like a human role that needs to come forward? Sorry. Sorry, Mary. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so in our work, uh, one of the things that's happening in it is that you know, the, the human audience member is having all these different kinds of relationships with the beings, um, the, the water beings that we're, that we're in relation to in the work. Um, sometimes you're like, you know, you have the God's eye view through that microscope and that penetrating, like, see all kind of experience where you're standing outside of that world and you're peering in and you're watching what's happening and you're, you're kind of tracking it. And we have all of this, you know, when, all these images, when you start searching for, um, you know, images from the microscope, and there's all these, you see all these like scientific classification systems and these cool drawings that 16th century um, scientists were doing of, of what they saw. And you can kind of see the, the scientific logics that are evolving out of that view that you have through the microscope. And then, you know, you, we have these kind of two immersive moments where you're walking into the projection space and you're, you're, you're sort of immersed in the space, the sound is around you, the images are on three walls. And then when you put the Oculus on, you're swimming, flying through this universe or this underwater world that, you know, as we understand it, it we conceptualize it as within this drop of water, and you become a microorganism, right? You're, and this, I remember Lisa saying something about this, um, about her experience of the work of swimming, swimming with these microorganisms as if you're one of them. So I think, I mean, in terms of decentering the human, in many ways we were playing with the idea, the question of, uh, of, of the possibility of that. Um, even though I think, you know, it's it's very difficult for us to decenter the human, certainly coming from Western logics. And so when I'm like, I became very attached to those to those creatures and to the stories of those creatures as we captured them on video. And as I was saying, like even noticing today how the protozoa were kind of bullying the rotifer and like, you know, cor corralling it out of their space 
or in the, I don't know if you, the, the, the one with the whale sounds that Dolene had me play back when she was talking, where we have, it's another, another rotifer, and the rotifer is, um, uh, it's called a rotifer because it's referring in Latin to the wheel, to, to the, there's a kind of sense of a, its mouth looks like wheels, and it's, it's got these little hairs that are, that are swishing around, and they're bringing all sorts of stuff into its mouth, so that's how it eats. So we kind of turned it into a scream by adding that whale sound, when it when it goes up into the air and its mouth opens, um, it's not screaming; it's eating. Um, its little things are twirling, and then it scrunches back down to swallow because it's I don't know it's not its teeth, but whatever it uses to chop up that food is deeper in its throat. But um, you know, it's it's actually the consciousness of that little being. Like even though. You know, I talk to Dolene and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm all bought in. Yeah, there's more than human, this Nado reality. Um, but I'm still, when I'm looking at those creatures, totally anthropomorphizing them and trying to understand them through the kind of narratives that, that I can give them. But I also don't believe, like on some fundamental level, I was assuming that they are kind of like without consciousness or something. But then when you watch them in those little scenes, you see them, you see their curiosity, you see their fear, you see their intention being expressed in ways that I don't understand. And maybe, maybe scientists have, have some understanding of that. Um, you know, if I did a deep dive into that research, but, but my own presuppositions about what that reality is are constantly being challenged um, in watching them in ways that make me realize how centered the human is in my in my perspective and in my in my viewpoint um, and the work that it is to constantly kind of push away from that and just to fin I know I'm talking for a long time but just to finish that is that kind of what it brings me back to and again this is in conversation with Dolene and with indigenous knowledges in a lot of ways when we were bringing in those wild water samples, um, I'm very conscious now that that water that I pull out of the St. Lawrence River is full of these universes of living beings that are inside those water samples, millions of them inside every sample. And so putting them in Tupperware, putting a lid on it, I had to punch holes in the top of the lid. I mean, partly we didn't want them to die because we want our audiences to see them alive and to be able to find them themselves but also i was just so conscious of having to enact a kind of stewardship and to make sure like that i wasn't killing these worlds by putting them in these plastic containers and in ways that wouldn't spill in my car when i drove from kingston to to toronto um that it was my i felt a responsibility to to ensure their well-being in some kind of way and i think i mean like that's what we want for the world right is that kind of shift of consciousness where we're we're decentering humans um, in a recognition that that all these life forms, all these natural these these beings are are crucial and important, and that they're there even if we can't see them. I'm going to open it up now to the floor for questions. Oh, look at this! I knew it, um, Annette. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, I, I think everything that you're doing and saying is brilliant <laughs> and right on. Um, and one thing I wanted to say is that I think in order to change um, the system, we need to get the leaders in here. Like, we need to have all the city councillors come and see this exhibition. I don't know if they ever come, but I've written a, written a million letters about saving Ontario Place because we have no access to green space and without any access to green space, you can't expect people to appreciate nature because they're not in it, they're not seeing it. And, you know, we need to fight for more green space in our cities for sure because we're all just in concrete and steel all day. Um, the other thing I want to say is that I think that we're inherently very selfish and um, I actually did a Nature of Things and went to Japan and interviewed the, the scientists who came up with the term forest bathing and they demonstrated to me that just walking in a forest of pine and oak trees will, you will um, ingest these substances that you can't see and it actually increases our natural killer cells and they're, they're the only cells we have that can fight cancer. So letting people know this kind of information makes them actually seek out these spaces 
and also children. You know, we need to have children have experiences in nature that are meaningful for them, and then they will grow up to love and have stewardship of it. And I don't think we're doing that very well. Um, but other research that I did said that children who are exposed to nature are much more altruistic and they care about other people more and they'll look out for nature. And so, you know, I want to encourage everyone to try to have more nature in your lives. Um, but also, I interviewed scientists in South Korea and um, up at Baycrest, and they proved that just looking at images of nature increases your memory. So all good reasons to have more exposure to nature. <laughs> Thanks, Annette. Oh, do I need, okay. Um, okay, yeah, no, that's okay. So you can hear me. Um, and uh, for some reason, I'm tempted to continue the conversation that we had a few weeks ago <laughs> during our other events. But one thing that I, that, I, that I keep going back to is, and I totally agree with what Mary just, just said about uh, um, the, the way in which we look at, um, we can change things, not, not by changing like materially things, but that, like changing the way we are looking at things, changing the way we, we know and we understand things, right? But um, I was looking at um, the role of technologies here because all of the, the people in this, uh, in this uh, exhibition use a lot the technologies, they're all media artists, right? And, then, and, and I'm brought back to what Jane said, that the media are able to tell stories that we might not be able to see. And, and also the scientific technologies like the microscope is able to tell stories. But I'm wondering what kind of stories we are telling people. And, and, I'm, and I'm also wondering if by telling these stories, we are also able to change the way in which people are seeing technologies. Because by talking with, pe with, with some people from uh, outside audience, I, I found a little bit of a like, resistance towards technologies, that the way in which technologies are able to reveal nature. Nature is filtered through technologies, not a way to um, give us access to nature. So all of these things, like I was very, I, I was wondering if you, if you gave a thought um, on these type of topics and, and on these uh, type of reactions. And yeah, so I'm just curious about the, the role of technologies here and what kind of uh, narratives they are telling. And, and again, like uh, going back into the thread of like telling stories and changing people's mind or changing people's approaches to nature through technologies? No, I think it's a great question. I'm going to pass it to you first, Jane. Um, I think it's a great question. Thank you, Roberta. Um, Technologies are complicated. Like, first of all, there's just the issue of, you know, like even building capacitors and, and the extractive nature of technology. So, I mean, I think that it's really complicated in general. Um, and I don't think that technologies are doing much for the planet. So I do recognize that. I, I have to recognize that, that it's, um, it's a part of the problem. But now that I've accepted that I'm, I'm working with these technologies, um, I think that each of the pieces offer, I mean, I think Mary and Dolene and Joel have spoken about sort of how uh, the microscope has shifted perspective, has helped people understand this, this sort of larger or this, this, this invisible world. But I think that, you know, like for example, atmospheric forest, it v helps visualize this complexity that's happening all around us that people can actually and see. There's these VOCs floating around. It's not just this conceptual idea that we don't have any way of understanding. And I think that we are very visual, that we, we tend to believe what we can see. And so I think the technologies sort of help bring that out. But then, you know, you think about, you know, Lindsay French's piece, and she has used cameras to um, do really, really high definition videos so that you are kind of, she directs you, she does these portraits. 
And so it asks you to think differently and see differently and, and in a way that is beyond our abilities. Like even my work here, there's, I'm visualizing stuff that's around us everywhere. So in, in a lot of ways, these technologies are helping us see something that is beyond our abilities. But then there's also the interaction and the technologies that facilitate those interactions. Like when you put that VR headset on and all of a sudden you're in this space and you're swimming with these more than human uh, water-based creatures or I'm using a leap motion and you can just use your hand and reach towards something. I, I just feel that it creates this opportunity for these gestures and these experiences that can be very powerful and potent. Thanks, Jane. Does anyone else want to? Um... Did anyone else here want to? Did any of you guys want to comment on that? Nope. Thanks. It's uh, just a comment about a couple, two comments. One is about the technologies. Uh, my grandson, I think, would really relate to some of the work here because he's so familiar with technology. You know, and I somehow people my age, I'm, I'm more remote. It's not a language for me, but I think there are many generations now in our world where technology is a language, and I think using it for these purposes is, is fantastic because you can communicate through this language to a certain group of people that, you know, I get missed on completely in some ways. And then on the other hand, um, when we talk about the human, I, I agree with, I think, what Mary said. Of, we're so clouded by our own perspective, where we come from. So um, the human that I saw in Ursula Beeman's film is just so radically different from my experience of being human that they're so much more open to receive what's out there than I am. And I've spent all my life in nature. So, it's, you know, it's... I guess I'm just trying to say that we have to look at who the people are as well and where they've come from. So. Can I just add one, one more thing? Um, because technology just reminded me that, you know, technology, are, it's ethics, right? It's um, technologies act ethically or not ethically in the world, like we know through discussions about AI. And I think that uh, one of the things that I think is really important about artists working with technology are that, is that artists are rebuilding them to have a different type of ethics. And I think that's also a really crucial part that, you know, uh, now technologies, and this is a big thing for my practice, I build technologies for very specific ends uh, where versus sort of playing out a capitalistic um, sort of, what's the word, playlist. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There was another question. Um, some of you, is it working? Yeah. Some of you worked with scientists and I'm wondering how that relationship was and how open they were to what you were doing and exploring things with you and that. Joel's undergrad was in science, so um, he is the scientist. So how is working with yourself? <laughs> um, no, no, okay, so um, it, it's, it, it is interesting now that, as an, as an artist, um, that we can be a bit more uh, open about the revelatory potential of artworks, especially true new media, which, you know, for better or worse, you know, it is the substrate that both the artists and scientists uh, kind of communicate true. Um, and, uh, and I would say this is very different from, from the time, I, I, I guess, when I was an undergraduate, just going out into, into graduate school, uh, where it was a lot about the artist as a provocateur, you know, in the, in the vein of Latour as, you know, going into the, the science laboratory to expose some of the things that were going on under the covers, you know, like what they were treating, how they were treating animals, for instance, how much waste, how much plastic the labor laboratory was generating. Uh, and it's a little bit different now, I would say. Uh, you know, at least institutionally, there are a lot of scientists who are um, uh, interested in collaborations. 
uh, at least on uh, from a shirk perspective as well, you know there are a lot of initiatives that are working to catalyze these interdisciplinary collaborations. So, you know, from from my standpoint, uh, it, it does seem hopeful, at least for the artists, that we don't have to be smuggling these world-changing concepts into our artworks and hope that there's an audience somewhere, you know, like science fiction, science fiction perhaps used to do, uh, and we can we can really be uh, working. Together, so I, I I would say in in my experience, you know, working with, actually there is one anecdote that I will say, um, as part of this project, we were looking at in terms of stories as well, Roberta, that you brought up, you know, stories, uh, we were looking at re relearning some of the stories of our past, and we had a workshop actually with scientists at the University of Puget Sound where we uh, had a very simple microbes plating workshop. You would go around the environment, swab your environment, plate it on a dish things would come up, pop up, and we would try to identify them. And then we would create stories out of them. And these stories had to relate somewhat to uh, mythologies that you grew up with or to your own personal stories, uh, right? And there was this one example of the scientist who was talking about um, uh, 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 um, Daedalus uh, you know, and Icarus flying up to the sun. And he, he, he rewrote this narrative as them using thermophilic bacteria as the glue for these wings, and so they actually reach the sun. <laughs> you know, and I think that there's, you know, there's, there's, there's some perspective of like these reshaping of, of, you know, it's a very, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's cross-disciplinary now that, that it's almost like disciplinarily agnostic, right? That, that this, this reshaping and re-indigenization or uh, relearning process and re-conversation, re you know, just this idea that, yes, we are now in a position where we all have to learn together. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite hopeful and an idealist, as they are as well, about how, where these conversations are going to go. Great image to, to think. <laughs> um, Susan? We have, we have one more question from the online audience. We have one question from an online audience. Um, their name is Ellen X. Uh, this question is actually, is actually directed to Dolene. Um, how does the reflection back through biology and evolution change your worldview from a Nishnabek perspective. They also stated that my son also said the art biology combo is dope. <laughs> the art, art, what? art biology combo. Um, what was the, can you say that, read the question again? Sure. How does the reflection back through biology and evolution change your worldview from a Nishabek perspective? How does the reflection back through biology? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I can really say that it's a reflection back through biology as as like as as in I'm un, what I'm I'm understanding of is a reflection back through this uh, microscopic um, people beings <laughs> other than human people um, I'm not sure if I could say that is the case um, so much as um, really when I'm, I'm thinking about the other than human uh, I'm particularly the um, Nido worlding which is really uh, um, the translation of Nido into uh, is uh, from a, a early in this century, uh, uh, an anthropologist um, translates Nido, which is uh, uh, Ojibwe and Ishnabe, uh, into uh, other than human persons. And other than human and more and more than human, they are two different things. Um, <clears throat> so when I take up the um, Nido worlding, I'm really talking more in along the lines of more than human, which um, uh, David Abrams, who, who writes The Spell of the Sensual, um, he's a phenomenologist, um, basically just rips off indigenous people from around the world 
<laughs> and uh, well, he says, oh, I got this from indigenous people. He doesn't really cite them, um, <clears throat> which is why I have a problem with that. And, um, you know, if I can just go back to that for a moment. So if we, so many artists are, are, uh, um, are informed by these scholarly concepts. And so they're exposed to uh, like um, post-humanism, new materialism, object-oriented ontology, or even Deleuze and Guattari's academic scholarship that are then reiterated, as Jane says earlier, into artwork that are made for humans. So my concern with is that these artworks is that artists may not be conscious um, of perpetuating these colonial logics that many of them don't even, are not even aware that they're actually indigenous concepts where um, Western thinkers, academic scholars have actually um, appropriated from indigenous thinkers. And I'm, when I say indigenous, I mean indigenous from around the globe um, where this, this, this knowledge is, has been stolen from essentially. And I think that um, because we are often our, our uh, we relay our knowledge orally, we're not cited. Um, <clears throat> so then they cite Western thinkers who, who have who are exercising uh, a, a colonial step. They're moved by erasing us from that equation. They actually don't move us out of that conceptual structure of imperialism. So that's the kind of the, uh, the the problem of this mix between the arts and the, the theoretical concepts that inform them. Uh, Latour being one of them, which he was mentioned here earlier. Um, <clears throat> and yet, I you know, at the same hand, artworks do in fact provide an opening and intimacy uh, via and particularly in relation to this, this exhibition through that immersion. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's a, for me, there's a, a concerning um, place where the academic scholarship and which is in often driving or informing these uh, creative works is I'm, uh, uh, because many people don't even realize that has been taken from indigenous um, thought. Uh, so, yeah, so, you know, that, I'm going back to that earlier question, but for myself, thinking about, you know, the worlding, um, <clears throat> so we, we often, my partner Mary and I, we often, you know, she often talks about world making, and I'm here talking about worlding, and I, you know, for me, I, I really see that as a, a, a human, a human uh, um, initiative to, to make to make worlds, right? It's, it has intention. Whereas, um, as I understand the world as Anishinaabe, that everything, absolutely everything is alive, not just humans or plants, absolutely everything, uh, even words themselves, language, it is alive, it's a living entity. Uh, and, and for me, that's, that's not, uh, it's not a, a conceptual framework. It's not just a, 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 a theory that I contemplate. I usually don't even think about it. It's, and that's, you know, that way of being. And uh, to learn for us is not like a, a, a resource that you, you put away in your pocket for later, pull it out. But when, it, when, you, when you learn, you become, you become that way of being, and it's become so entangled, you can't really even uh, um, pull it apart. It becomes difficult to conceptualize it outside of your, your being in the world. And, and uh, so when I talk about that Nado worlding, I'm, I'm speaking about uh, um, a, uh, a way of knowing that exceeds human consciousness, but that I, which I understand to be the actual, the real, um, <clears throat> and that 
from what what I in my my human uh, form, this this um, finite being. When I say finite, I mean I mean my human self that it was born and will one day die. So I I'm uh, I'm a mortal being, a human, and I would I was born and now I will die. So I've have have a um, my um, my time is 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 bounded by that by those two horizons and uh, <clears throat> and so in within that this physical body requires food requires sustenance to live to continue um, it requires clothing and i'm concerned you know i'm concerned with my with this entity and with my uh, various projects and my relationships uh, and at the other hand and, I, and I'm, I'm fully aware of those concerns, right? They're, they're present to me. And on, on the other hand, uh, I'm, I'm just really um, interested in, in, in moving forward in Anishinaabe philosophy where, where we, we talk about spirit, because that's another translation of Nado. Um, <clears throat> we say spirit. Um, <clears throat> but you know, when I asked my mom, what, what is this? I, you know, as a child, what is this? The dough. And, uh, and spirit, like she's in spirit. And I said, well, what is that? What does that mean, really? And she takes me to the window. She says, look, describe what's out there. And I start telling her everything I see. And she said, yeah, see that? That's spirit. <laughs> it's all alive. Uh, it's everything. And, and, but part of that is, and, and we, we identify them it, with this, finite being with this this mind I can only perceive it as such as as these individual entities there's a tree there's a cat there's a car uh, <clears throat> and my relationship to it this is my how I, I'm creating this meaning from this human centric perspective and uh, <clears throat> but on the other hand we know through various means there's other ways of knowing we might say call it intuition Right? My mom would say that was the, the closest English word that she could think of to describe that, that uh, we have, we're, we're struck by a, a, a sudden realization or a, a pull towards someone else or a, a, a sudden desire to act in a certain way at a certain time. Um, <clears throat> and, and for me, that was that what I was describing as, as middle worlding, as in this... Um, realm of the spirit, which, and all these other than human are that, they're spirit. So in, in, in the actual translation from that, Nido is really um, process, potency, potential, energy. So when you think about that in relation to just spirit, <laughs> it, 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 it uh, um, really blows um, that concept wide open to have, uh, you know, and, and you know, and we think about that then also in relation to an Ishnabe Moin, which is in, in, uh, uh, in our, our language, which is somewhere between 70 and 90% verbs. So in a decolonizing you know, initiative, I, I'm, I'm questioning our use of um, Western logics, for example. And part of that is in the language we use. And many of us, um, even indigenous peoples, we've been forced into this um, this uh, 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 colonial languages, right? And our, our own languages were made illegal. So um, <clears throat> to question these colonial languages, they, they're not innocuous. A lot of people say, oh, well, it's a great, it's a bridge language. We can all have the same language. We can all understand each other, but it is not innocuous. It does something. It performs something. It is alive. And it's initiating a particular logic. There is, every language has a, a law and a structure that it abides by. And that law then governs the way we think, which then, uh, um, then informs the way we enact in the world. So for me, uh, even the visual or these um, digital arts, artwork, they, they go hand in hand. They cannot be separated from one another. Um, so it's, it's, it's important for me 
uh, and the work that I do to constantly be um, critiquing and questioning, questioning that my use of language and how I use it. Um, <clears throat> so in this in the world, in this, when we have this sudden realization or drive or pull to perform, for me, I, I, I understand that as, um, <clears throat> as a, a, um, an, a, the actual, the real world of the infinite, which this, this entity and all, all of the world, all of existence as one body that's, that's, um, um, that dances together, that is, is moves together. And that it, and it's only in, in a, a, a state of a slackened consciousness when I'm unguarded by my human constraints of reason making that uh, that the real is able to penetrate that guarded world of mine, which is not the real. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, I <laughs> I'm not really sure how to condense that to make it um, more comprehensive. Um. It was perfect. <laughs> Miigwech. Miigwech. Yeah, we're gonna end now. I think that's a perfect note to end that on. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with all of us, and thank you all for the hard work that you've put into putting forward your ideas and, and your bravery. And uh, I, I, that just seems to be my word for today. I, I, I feel like these works are, are, are brave. Um, thank you everyone for coming. There have been other events that are part of this exhibition. And so I'm encouraging you all, if you want to, just uh, go on YouTube and search for Onsite Gallery if you want to watch any other videos of um, events related to this exhibition or other exhibitions that we've had. This exhibition runs until May the 14th, and then, sorry, 13th, sorry, till the 13th, we are not open on Sundays, and um, we'll be opening with uh, another exhibition on June the 14th uh, called On Americanity um, that uh, brings in artists and designers from, uh, actually from Montreal, Toronto, and Bogota, Colombia that are, are questioning the idea of um, what it means to be uh, American, and, and it actually teases out, and it, um, it, it's not in relation to this exhibition at all, but there are some of the questions that are approached in this exhibition about colonialism uh, and um, knowledge creation that are also addressed in that exhibition. But thanks for coming, and don't forget my final plug for our free publication, because it is nice to have these shared around. And thanks again for coming. Um, and thank you for making this work and sharing of yourselves today. Thanks, uh, Dolene and, and Mary.